John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that first next. Big jab there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh. Down goes Duffy on Cole. Frank Mir does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull****. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, is it good to be with you? I'm always glad when my man Ken Flo is back in the United States of America. Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023. It's episode 406 of the Anik and Florian podcast. And we got theme music now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a radio guy. I've always wanted theme music. Anyone out there listens to Colin Coward, let me know his song is sort of synonymous with the show. So Ken Flo calls on his guy, Seamus Ryan, a.k.a. MC Esoteric, and the Boston Garden Rap here to four will be the theme song of the Anakin Florian podcast. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely, man. MC Esoteric's the man. SL, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, dude, it's good to see you, man. So we got the rights to that song, and it was almost as, as easy as Ken Flo just sending off a text message, you know? <laughs> Pretty exciting stuff. But uh, we didn't tease your appearance with some of the uh the mount rushmore fighters in ufc history legends all including kenny florian i think i saw anderson silva george st pierre matt Serra. so tell us all that was the last weekend for you and then on the back end you know just tell us why you didn't promote it here on the etiquette florian podcast because i know a lot of our listenership would have loved to have seen all of you legends in person i i didn't promote it because i'm a dummy and i'm terrible at promoting myself but um i had a good time man i, I was uh I was uh, out of my element there. I had a bunch of legends, you know, champions, iconic fighters around me. I was just happy to be there, dude. Uh, but, you know, Anderson Silva, Chuck Liddell, Rampage Jackson, George St. Pierre, Matt Serra, uh, all those guys. Matt Hughes. I mean, it was awesome. That's right. Leon, was Leon Edwards was there. I was upset. I didn't get a chance. Leon, you know, we're all kind of signing and doing our own thing, and it was tough for me to go over and, and, and bother Leon Edwards in, in between signing autographs and stuff. But uh, I really wanted to talk to him. That was one of the fighters I, I haven't really been able to meet and talk to. Oh. It was a great time. But you know who I think would have had the biggest booth there? I'm not even lying. John Anik, if he was there. If John Anik was there. Come I, on. Dude, I had so many purpose. First of all, thank you to all the fans who came over and said all those nice things about the podcast. But everyone came over not only to like say how they want to meet you one day but how good you are at your job i mean obviously that is the most common uh, comment i get um so i feel like i always need to relay that message to well, you thank but you buddy you are so much appreciated in the uk dude like people were going nuts They're like you gotta have anik we, we you know huh. i want i want his autograph you know he should be here we need to get some stuff signed by him can you guys have some stuff that is signed by you guys in the store so we can buy it that's the one audio i'm not even jo like that is legit wow. what they were saying so anyways um i forget all the names that came over to me but um there were a bunch of guys and uh, it was cool dude it was cool Love well, that up. gives me chills, and I appreciate you passing that along. And you and I have talked about this in the past. There's nothing better than when someone comes up to us on the road and says, hey, I listen to the Anakin Florian podcast, right? Because as much as yeah. we appreciate all of the feedback that comes with the television work, this is sort of the side project. You could call it side hustle, right? But this is really, as trite as it sounds, the labor of love, the way we connect and give back to fans. So when we feel that connection reciprocated and someone comes up to us and says, I've ingested all of this free content over the last eight years, it's very special. And that's why this podcast will always be free, audio, video. But that's very special. And yes, I do think at some point in time, and the autograph merchandise is not an issue. But I do think we should make an appearance and do a live Anakin Florian podcast yes. at some point in time. There's a lot of different things that go into that in terms of scheduling and everything else. But we'll get Longo. We'll get our producer, Cody Merrow. Wheels up. We'll go overseas and we'll bring the Let's Anakin go. Florian podcast to uh, to the people. All right. Anakin Florian podcast presented by DraftKings. Full episodes of the show on the DraftKings YouTube channel. Thanks in advance to everybody for liking the show, subscribing and all of that noise. Nothing has changed on the audio side. There's so much to get to this week. It's a pay-per-view week, UFC 288. Of course, we have a UFC fight night to recap. Song Yudong, in my mind, has never looked better in his win over Ricky Simone. Uh, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship took center stage. What a great weekend for them to have their biggest show to date, right, against a UFC fight night that didn't necessarily have the depth of some others. So a huge weekend for BKFC. 
So much to get into. Uh, I do want to start with Song Yadong, if I could. Ray Longo, by the way, coming up in about 20 minutes. I've never been more anxious to talk to Ray Longo in my life in advance of Aljamain Sterling's late title defense. Of course, Matt, the steamroller for Bowl on the fight card as well. But, dude, how about Song Yadong? And this is another reason why you should have great pause in my mind in betting mixed martial arts, especially at the highest levels, because as great as Song Yadong looked against Corey Sanhagen, he took it to that next level. And this fight got delayed and extended, right? Delayed a week from the previous week and then extended from three rounds to five. Song Yadong by TKO in round five. And uh, I know I talked about Ricky Simone last week being maybe my favorite fighter on the roster. Um, Send me the song you donk fight kit, man. All of a sudden, I'm all in. I don't know that he's ever looked like a world champion to me until this past Saturday night. He looked phenomenal. Uh, clearly doing his work uh, outside of you know outside of the cage, you know, and in the gym. That was one of those fights. I said it on the last podcast. The more I thought about that fight, the more nervous I was about that pick. Again, Ricky Simone, a, a, a tremendous fighter, excellent fighter, was a tough matchup. For Song Yadong, but it just showed that Song Yadong is making massive improvements. He's a true martial artist who's always getting better. Thought he looked great against Sanhagen. I think this also puts um, you know, that that win by Sanhagen into perspective a little bit more, into context a little bit more, and it, it makes it that much more impressive for Corey. But again, Song Yadong is legit, dude. That division is just insane. And to see him get that win in that fashion, I think was huge for the man. Uh, big congrats for him. Uh, I was saying there's value on him. I almost switched my yeah. pick. I decided not to. But, uh, yeah, what a win, man. That was very, very impressive. You know, my twin brother, I inject his name into the conversation a lot. He's he's not an I told you so type of guy, but he was so bullish on Song Yadong's chances. And part of it was just you talk about the improvements and just the appetite for learning. And he just lives in the gym, and I'm taking notes as you speak, right? True martial artist, tremendous cardiovascular base. We talk about Ricky Simone and May Rob Dwalish Willie in these glorifying terms about their ability to go 10 rounds. What an absolute beast, Song Yadong. He looked like he could have gone 20 rounds, right? The takedown defense, the ability to shuck Simone off every time he got in what you may describe as a compromising situation, his ability to immediately get out of it, uh, and then the the way he was able to finish the fight, uh, a huge, huge win for Song Yadong. And I think you have to give a lot of credit to these team alpha male coaches, right? You know, Danny Castillo doesn't have a mantle full of coach of the year awards. Neither does Uriah Faber, but you know, they get people to buy in and a lot of these guys are loyalists and Song Yadong uh, has been there a long time and he's reaping the benefits. I think. Yeah, no question about it, man. Huge win. And again, doing it in that fashion against a, Tough stylistic matchup, I think, is going to do wonders for his confidence and propel him forward for sure. And he, he's a threat against anybody in that division. And that division, again, is absolutely stacked. And we'll see what they do with Song Yadong. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that eventually he finds himself in a Corey Sandhagen rematch. Dominic Cruz, I think, is a fight that does make some sense. Just because Song Yadong is one and one spanning his last two. And I think anytime you get the chance to fight one of the all-time greats, one of the few former undisputed UFC Bantamweight champions, I think, you know, it has upside. Cody, of course, always right there to support the show. He lists the top guys in the Bantamweight division. You know, Marlon Cheeto Vera, I think, is a fight that potentially could materialize. You remember the first fight between those two? A lot of people felt like Cheeto was on the wrong end of a uh, decision that he should have won against Song Yudong, if I'm not mistaken. So I know one guy's off a win, one guy's off a loss. Perhaps that makes some sense. Uh, quickly wanted to get your thoughts on Kyle Bohalio, another one of the performance of the night bonus winners at UFC Fight Night there at the UFC Apex. So you wanted a three-unit play on this guy. You were very bullish about his chances, and uh, he made you look pretty smart there. It is Kyle Bohalio over the previously pretty damn durable Mikhail Olekshajic, rear naked choke at 249 around two. Your thoughts on that? Well, Bohalio is smart, and he just knows how to put it all together. Um, I thought he did a great job of making the right adjustments, getting the fight to the floor, uh, and imposing that pressure. And Mixing in the strikes, I think a lot of jujitsu guys have that problem. Adolfo Vieira, who's coming off a, a great win, is still kind of struggling with putting it all together, getting his jiu-jitsu to really shine all the time. Um, but uh, Bohalio has figured it out. He, he's, he's looked great. He's obviously been working extremely hard 
on his striking, on his wrestling, again, and putting it all together. Looked phenomenal. That's where I thought he'd be able to win the fight, uh, whether it was just out-positioning him through three rounds or ultimately getting the position that was going to get him the submission. That's exactly what he did. Uh, excellent performance. I loved that matchup for him. And he called out a, you know, another smart uh, fight for him, I think, and Derek Brunson. So I think he's managing things properly. He's putting it all together. He's certainly someone to watch and uh, going to do big things in the UFC, I think. Yeah, we'll see what the future holds for Derek Brunson, but I do share your optimism on Kayo Bohalio. The other bonus winners, Hadolfo Vieta and Marcus McGee, who stepped in for Brian Kelleher against Journey Newsom. $50,000 goes his way for the rear naked choke as part of the uh, prelim portion. Sort of an interesting card. Some fights fell off, some fights at catch weight, but uh, congratulations to the big winners, Kayo Bohalio, Song Yadong, Hadolfo Vieta, and Marcus McGee. Quickly want to share or get your thoughts, I should say, on Ricky Simone. I'm not sure if you have anything in terms of uh, if this lowers his ceiling, the lessons to be gained from this fight. Uh, but there were a lot of people, obviously, who were high on Ricky Simone, maybe Brian Petrie, chief among them. Any thoughts on Ricky Simone and defeat before we move on? I, I thought he was doing a good job of setting up his takedowns as he went into the rounds two and three a little bit. But I, I definitely saw a little bit of hesitation uh, and a lack of speed when it came to his striking and his striking position. I think he... Um, presented his body a little bit too much. So positionally, he was a little bit too square and Yudong was taking advantage of that. I, I said in the last podcast, you got to be careful with Yudong in boxing range. And I think he was in there a little bit too much. He was landing some shots and I think he was having some success there, but he was offering up that head and that body a little bit too much. And ultimately it was Song Yudong who found his mark and ended up putting him down. But um, you know, I, I think he's going to learn from this. I think he just needs to be sharper defensively as a striker, and I, I think that's a very fixable thing. Um, every time we've seen Ricky deal with some adversity in his career, he always comes back stronger. I expect the same uh, after this result against Song Yudong. So um, just just needs to be sharper defensively, and and I think we'll see a, an even better uh, Ricky Simon this time. He's got a lot of fans around these parts. We hope Ricky Simone will uh, rally past this setback. And for Song Yudong, I think he's got a chance to uh, position himself at least to challenge at some point for the belt, right? What an amazing response after the Corey Sandhagen fight. We have never had a male Chinese champion in UFC history. The leech, Li Jing Liang, has certainly flirted with the rankings, has had long winning streaks and big moments, and is the consensus most successful male fighter out of China in the UFC. But Song Yudong, I think, is closing that gap pretty quickly. And uh, with the leech not healthy, I think right now Song Yudong has the inside track in terms of uh, title contention for the men, uh, for on the men's side in China, you know? Yeah, two, two things. Uh, and Cody's just reminding me, you know, Simone had less than 60 seconds control control time through five rounds. I would have liked to have seen better control. Thank you for reminding me there, too, uh, Cody. I, I think he could have been a, done a better job of pinning those shoulders down a little bit more. I think his positioning was a little bit off. But in regards to Song Yudong, I think he is the best fighter out of China right now. No question about it. As far as yeah. the males go, uh, he's got the best shot of being a uh, future world champion. Yan Xiaonan on the women's side for China competes this weekend at UFC 288 against Jessica Andrade. That should be a great fight, an explosive fight. And Yan Xiaonan, another fighter from Team Alpha Male, uh, trying to, uh, to get into title contention. All right, I want to talk to you about BKFC. And we congratulate David Feldman, the entire organization, on a big weekend but Platinum Mike Perry, in a lot of respects, he's played the long game now in terms of combat sports. I remember some of the UFC setbacks against Jeff Neal and just nice to see him cash in checks. I remember when I was voicing EA Sports UFC 3 several years ago now, and I was going to a New York Mets game and I ran into Mike Perry and Olawale Bamboche on the subway and Mike Perry going to look for new looks in training even way back then. And even though maybe there have been times that he's lacked discipline or the optimal training camp in advance of a big fight, uh, just really happened for happy for a, a fighter's fighter, Platinum Mike Perry, as he gets it done against a very big and seemingly very dangerous Luke Rockhold in any combat sports setting. No question about it. You know, first of all, every time I see BKFC, I'm like, man, uh, I fought MMA. That is a tough way to make a living. However, I think Mike Perry is cut out very well for that sport, man. I, I think we'd see a Mike Perry that would often get injured where, you know, from grappling, wrestling, jujitsu. There's so many ways you can hurt yourself in mixed martial arts. Uh, and obviously the, 
the fight, the night of the fight, I think BKFC is more brutal in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Taking those strikes. However, the preparation leading up to that, I think we've seen a Mike Perry that's looking pretty good. I mean, he's, he's moving well. Um, I think he's looking fast. He's looking lean. He's looking like he's in shape. He's landing big shots and doing it against a huge guy in Luke Rockhold. Um, and I think he's fighting a lot smarter than he was when we were seeing him over in the UFC. And, you know, maybe the, the, the competition isn't as elite, okay? But um, – and, and it, I, I think this is bringing out a lot of strength in Mike, Perry, Mike Perry's game um, that I, I think is going to serve him well. I don't know if he's going to continue doing that, if he wants to go back to, to MMA. But it's great to see Mike Perry find his little niche and, and do yeah. so well, man, as far as, like, how he promotes fights, how he fights, his toughness. The dude's a beast. He's got big, heavy hands. He's got a young family. Very happy for just a really good dude who I think at times has been misunderstood by a lot of people. So the Luke Rockhold side of this is interesting, right? And I think when your teeth get broken like that and chips go flying, you know, you got to try to minimize the damage. Ben Rothwell with Ariel Helwani had some comments to say about the damage in this sport relative to mixed martial arts. And I think his comments dovetail with a, a lot of what you're saying about the grappling and the wrestling and how many injuries can materialize, not just on fight night, but in the lead up to the fight. But, bro, this is not for the faint of heart. This is absolutely brutal. And I think, as Eddie Alvarez put it well, um, you know, this ain't necessarily for the athletes. This is for the uh, the dogs <laughs> and the it's a, Dude, it's absolutely brutal. First of all, uh, can, can, can we raise our hand for a double mouth guard? Can we get one that goes on right. the lower part of the teeth there as well? My goodness, just nasty, man. You're, you, you're seeing these kind of injuries because of the, the lack of padding, right? Where And you, you've seen it in, in mixed martial arts as well, but it's it's way more rare. Um, but, yeah, just nasty, dude. There, there's a reason why – you know, they switched uh, from the bare knuckles to the gloves in boxing hundreds of years ago. You know, it, it is a totally different approach. And you have to be so smart about conserving your hands as well and where you punch. Yeah. You can't be as active. You can't be just swinging anywhere wildly. You have to be very precise with where you put your shots. And um, this was one of those, man, for Rockhold, who's been doing this a very long time, where I thought he looked good coming out. You know, he, he's, he, he likes being in the limelight. I think he yeah. liked that walkout. But when he ate a couple of those bare-knuckle shots against Mike Perry, he's like, it just seemed like he didn't want to be there anymore. And, um, again, I, I, I don't know if he's fighting for a paycheck or not. That may be the case. But here you have a good-looking guy in Luke Rockhold who – didn't look so good looking at after the fight, man. I felt bad. I, I I really did. It's this isn't for everybody, dude. That cage that uh, BKFC is not for everybody. Luke Rocco did post about the fight, and he sort of deadpan. Some gloves would be nice for the next one, but I do think big picture, a lot of these guys just want to scratch this combat sports itch, and there are only so many venues in which you can do it. Of course, Conor McGregor had a stare down with Platinum Mike Perry, and certainly we are of full expectation that Conor McGregor is going to fight multiple times in the UFC, and hopefully in the not-too-distant future, but I just think it's interesting for a lot of fighters who feel like they're cut from this cloth and can realize success in this medium. I'm one and one on the streets lifetime. I mean... You probably haven't taken a lot of bare knuckle shots to your head or face in your life, right? Certainly, you grew up with a lot of brothers. Like, we used to do, yeah. like, 40% just punching each other in the face. But I don't know how many clean shots other than uh, Brian Fisher at Gettysburg College that one time. I haven't taken a lot of bare knuckles on my head. Yeah, I, I, I got sucker punched over at Great Woods at a concert one time. Got got the little the poke on the shoulder. I was like, yes, boom. Uh -huh. Right here, right here. Just rip rip my eye open the cheek. Wow. Open. But uh yeah. Uh so it was like it was just an all out brawl with basically me and another dude against like six dudes and my other friends from Dover Sherbin, like, oh my god, what do I do? So was this the guy who got such yeah. a punch about this age, you know. Yeah, it was. This it guy? Was. Yeah, it was. I mean, it looks like a punchable <laughs> face, kind of. No? It really I does. Punch that I was, face. I, dude, I was like 100, 140 pounds soaking wet with two bricks in my pocket. And, uh, yeah, it was crazy. But, uh, yeah, dude, listen, you know, bare-knuckle fighting, this is why you grapple. This is why you learn how to grapple because, right. first of all, not right. only are your hands going to break, but one shot, you have one shot that's not even a great shot, and you get your face ripped open. Like, that's yeah. just what happens. So I don't know if Keith Florian listens to the Anakin Florian podcast the way Dr. Gus Florian does religiously. I bet Keith was a street fighter, no? 
He definitely was. <laughs> yeah, he was. He uh, he 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 was known uh, several towns over. Yes, <laughs> there are actually some stories about Keith that we can't share, <laughs> and hopefully we didn't just incriminate him. But yeah, I mean Keith. You know, you talk about everybody named Keith being no nonsense, right? Keith Peterson, <laughs> Keith Florian, that Keith Florian is f-ing no nonsense. So Eddie Alvarez and Chad Mendez fight to a split decision, and Chad Mendez now I think finally feels like he can walk into retirement yeah. with clear intentions and uh, a tremendous, tremendous fight. I just, uh, I don't know, man. I've talked about not being able to relate to the physical and the mental toughness of these athletes so much, but particularly in this setting, man, it's just incredible to watch these guys just eat bone on bone and get knocked down and, and fight right through it. Just absolute f-ing dogs. Dude, absolutely. Mendez and Alvarez. What a fight, first of all. Just freaking kudos to those two who not only brought it but we saw some great technique there was some excellent boxing excellent exchanges back and forth they were aggressive they were going for it it was technical like man kudos to both those guys uh i was loving that fight um i thought that uh, both guys looked great i think alvarez was just landing maybe a little bit harder was fighting a little bit smarter uh, Mendez looked like just a ball of muscle, man. He remi- reminded me of Sean Shirk in that fight. Yeah. But uh, Alvarez, again, we, we know how tough he is. He's proved it, I mean, hundreds of times, I think. But uh, what a fight, dude. The two studs going at it. The underground king, right? The underground yeah. king, Eddie Alvarez. All right, big weekend for BKFC. We congratulate them on that. But, of course, you know what it is this weekend. UFC 288 destined to deliver with a bantamweight banger in the main event. Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo. Who leaves Jersey with the title? Well, you can place your bets right now on DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC. New customers can make a $5 bet and score $150 in bonus bets instantly. But everyone can take the MMA action to the next level with DraftKings Same Game Parlays. You combine multiple bets for a shot at an even bigger payout. And I've got to tell you, folks, the two biggest fights of the night are both exceeding close on the number. Aljo and Cejudo have been hovering at a pick all week. Gilbert Burns just a slight favorite against Bilal Muhammad in an incredibly high stakes welterweight co-main event. If I were you, I'd want to get in on the action, so download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code AFPOD, bet $5 on any UFC 288 fight, and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That is this Saturday on DraftKings Sportsbook with code AFPOD. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER in Massachusetts. 1-800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in Kansas. Call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for offer details. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Ray Longo is going to read the DraftKings Sportsbook spot next week. <laughs> But for now, all we ask of him during this championship fight week for Team Sarah Longo is a few minutes. Let's get to the Ray Longo Minute. It's now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. Oh, my goodness. The star of UFC 288 Countdown. Can he come out? blazing today he drew he, he drew he did he drew his sword he, 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 he's right ready. away i'm trying he's to ready. concentrate on the, i'm trying to concentrate on the fights the guys attacking me with the draft kings okay ah. <laughs> how was your little trip in london kenny it was great i hung out with a one matt sarah i don't know you may know him uh yeah. hey, was... he's a trip man that dude is so funny <laughs> he is awesome he doesn't stop he doesn't stop. He really doesn't stop. Yeah, it's so I hate to harp on this, Ray. You think I give you a hard time all the time. So I'm going to give Kenny a hard time, right? Okay. Do you think he could let the Anakin Florian podcast listenership know that he's going <laughs> overseas to hang out with Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre? Like, you maybe want to let our listeners know, right? Like, I mean, couldn't they go, like, see your ass? Like, what are we doing here? I mean, some people I don't know listen. What I'm doing. <laughs> Some people listen to the show. I figured he could have let them know. I mean, this guy would have let everybody. <laughs> oh, that guy. I agree. Thank, you. Thank, God. Thank God there was no social media back then. That would have been a disaster <laughs> with that guy. So how are you doing? It was great to see you shine on Countdown for UFC 288. At one point, Long goes like, all right, I'm out of here, you know, and then they cut. I mean, absolutely beautiful. Star oh. of the show. 
<laughs> I got to go back and watch it. <laughs> you do I, need to go back and watch it. Uh, somebody sent me a clip. I got. I really do have to go back and watch. But man, everybody's feeling good. Very psyched for this weekend. They're going to be great fights. Uh, I don't know. I'm just. I'm all just right. happy. Everybody's healthy, and that's all that matters. Good weight cut. Good rehire. These guys are ready to go. All right, enough. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, good. Your training camp is great. Good for you. I'm fucking ready to go. All right. Kenny's going to get you. Uh, Holy. On, dude, to who, you, okay? you have to stay away from the juju. Yeah. I'm to. not on the juju. I'm Come excited. On, this, is, this can't be natural. We just <laughs> had, I can take it down a little bit if you would like in terms of the energy. I mean, oftentimes I say whether it's a UFC broadcast or the Anakin Florian podcast, the one thing I can control is my energy. We've just had three successive UFC live events. I didn't get a chance to call any of them. I'm excited. There's no Adderall. There's no speed. There's no cocaine. Nothing. None of that in my this system. This is natural. Yes. Wow, Kenny, I'm impressed. See? It's fight I'm, week. He's ready. I'm He's super ready. impressed. I'm going to start with a softball, and then Kenny's going to ask you about Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo. Yeah, definitely. Song Yudong against Ricky Simone. I got to tell you, man, I didn't fancy Song Yudong a real-world title threat until this past Saturday night. I feel like he kind of unleashed a different, better version that really looks uh, like championship ilk. What were your thoughts on uh, Song Yudong? Uh, well, I'll keep it. Well, first off, I don't think he's been in a lot of good fights. I think, to me, the difference in that fight was the experience of the guys uh, Song was fighting before that. And Ricky just didn't have that. Uh, that that's right off the bat. He fought some really good guys. When you're in there with good guys, anything lesser than that, I think you see a big difference. And I think, I think you know, Ricky Simone, he's good. He's good. He's not great, but he is good. He's, uh, you know, he's a gamer, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's the fight to look at. You know, I don't think Ricky was at the point, you know, of a, like a Corey Sanhagen or any, uh, some of the other guys, Marlon Marais. So I think that that's why you saw what happened. I mean, I, I definitely picked Song to win that fight. Um, I don't know. I just looked at, I always look at who the guys have fought before that. That's the oh, first fair. thing I, I normally do. And, and I just think he fought the better competition. And I think it really looked like that. You could see there was a big discrepancy in a lot of areas. And I and I honestly, I don't know what Simone was even trying to do in that fight. He just got stymied and shut down. And he looked like he didn't know if he, you know, I mean, he can strike. You know, we know he could wrestle. He's got a good gas tank. It seemed like he didn't use any of those things synergistically at any time. Like, you know what I mean? Once he got stopped one way, he went to the other thing and he got stopped. He kind of came back. I, I don't know. I, I thought it was, he, he's good. He, he's good, but he's not, uh, I think that proves that he's not where he thought he was. I think that's where I'm kind of feeling with that. I think he thinks he's better than he is and he is very good. It's not a knock. I just think he's got to get his head together, regroup and, you know, he's going to have some tough fights now coming up. He's not going to have an easy go, you know? Yeah. Right. You know, when I'm thinking about this Aljo and Cejudo fight, it, it can be a tough one. And and I guess I'm wondering where your head is at as a coach and, and how you prepare a fighter for a guy who's been out for three years. Right. Do, is is that something you harp on? Um, are, are, again, so much can change in three years. He could be a completely different fighter. Where are you mentally and where is Aljo mentally and, and kind of how did you prepare for that that long layoff and a guy who obviously is a phenomenal fighter, excellent pedigree, excellent credentials, but you haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, I mean, look, we well, first off, Henry's not stupid. He's definitely a student in the game. You you know, you listen to him break down fights. He's he sees something in Aljo he thinks he can exploit. I think the difference is going to be when he can't exploit it. Does he have a plan B? Because Aljo is a really tough guy to prepare for. He's Super unorthodox. I'm going to say Aljo sometimes doesn't know what Aljo is going to do, you know, and right. he's, you know, he's kick heavy, which isn't easy to find a guy that could do that and mix in the takedowns. And I, I think a huge discrepancy will be if, if Aljo gets on top, that'll be uh, an absolute nightmare for Cejudo, a position where we haven't really seen him in with a guy of Aljo's caliber, you know, like defending his neck for three or four minutes. So, uh, you know, as far as the layoff, I mean, you just take it like the guy fought last week. Have we Do we harp on it? No. Do we? Right. Did we talk about it and mention it? Yes, of course. Obviously, it's – but you don't know. You don't want to go in there going, oh, he's, he's got a three-year layoff. He'll never be the same. That, then you'd be setting yourself up for a disaster. So, you know, Aljo's camps the last couple of times is, you know, it's kind of like a rinse and repeat. He's got his process that he loves – 
uh, the way things are set up and he sticks with it. And, uh, you know, we'll just take it from there. But I think if Aljo, you know, like, again, his head's in the right spot, the rehigh goes great. Aljo will be a nightmare for that guy. I mean, because I, I, you know, Aljo's just, somebody said, will this be his toughest fight? And I said, uh, no, I think the second Jan fight by far was the toughest fight because of what he had to go through and then he had to prove it. I mean, there had to be pressure on him, uh, you know, just to prove himself with that fight. So I think Aljo right now, what you're seeing is a guy that's very, very grateful to be in the position he's in. He loves everything about his life. Uh, you know, training camp went really well. He looked freaking phenomenal. And he's just going to take it. You know, he's just going to fight and that's it. He's not putting any pressure on himself for sure. And I think that's what's really going to make him dangerous in this fight. The Ray Longo Minute every week here on the Anakin Florian podcast. I have a lot written down to get to with you today. I'm going to try to be a little bit more subdued with my energy. There are a lot of monotone broadcast journalists out there. If you'd like me to fall in line. No, no, go crazy. That guy. All right, leader. so it's I, Tuesday I, I, of fight week, Ray. It's Tuesday. It's 1 p.m. Eastern time. For me, wheels up to Newark, New Jersey tomorrow morning. For you, it's wheels down. You get to drive. It's within the tri-state area. When are you leaving? I'll be... <laughs> wow, I gotta tell you, Kenny, this he might have surpassed all other episodes. I think, today. I he's excited, he's no, excited. He's very dead. Damn, yeah, I hope it's infectious. Uh, I was I've been doing nothing but child care for half a month. I can't I, wait to get yeah. out of it. And it's a, it's a pay per view on the east coast, it's not a huge flight for him. He's excited, yeah, yeah that's it. You should be happy about that, too. But uh, yeah. I should be there Wednesday night or early uh, Thursday morning. I definitely want to make the uh, interview uh, with you and whoever you're doing it with. Yeah. No, right? Don't do you have an interview sure. scheduled at like 12 with him? Yeah. yeah. I think that's when it is. Yeah. I got my Frankie Edgar shirt on out of respect in New Jersey. Looks like I'm pitting out. So the uh, the arm and hammer deodorant is failing me today. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh yeah, I'm excited to take a piss outside. We can't, get, we, we, we can't keep those pits dry, no matter what. Oh, there's nothing. No, what I do, what I've been wearing is a lot of black clothing, and wow. that seems to uh, just mask the issue. But we're going fe for Frank Edgar because you know we're going to uh, to New Jersey this weekend. Okay, so one thing on UFC 288 countdown that Aljamain Sterling said, and again, when your athletes like Chris Weidman and Ally Quint and Aljamain Sterling talk about you publicly. It's amazing for us to hear because we always know you to be that guy. But then when they describe you as just being a great ear or a great resource or taking them for who they are, however quirky, like the UFC Bantamweight champion, Aljamain Sterling, right? I just give you a lot of credit for navigating all of these different athletes. Like you think I'm out of my skull piece. How about Matt Serra, right? Tremendous <laughs> navigation by Ray Longo. But it seems to me from afar that you and Aljamain Sterling have spent a lot more time together during this training camp than the past two previous training camps where he was primarily in Las Vegas. Is that true or not? Uh, I'm going to say I guess that's true. But we're always in communication no right. matter where he is. And um, yeah, you, I, I tell you, listen, first of all, <laughs> I'm at the point you'd have to ask these guys. I, I'm forgetting a sure. lot of stuff at this point. Man. It's not it's not good. I mean, we just had it. I don't even know. But, but it um, seems as though you are very, is it malleable or malleable, the word, right? That if he's in Vegas, the communication is that way. If he's going to be in Garden yeah, City, you know, yeah, York, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I, and I just think that he, you guys have withstood the test of time yeah. as head coach and champion because – you guys have been able to navigate those things better than a lot of athletes and coaches would. Oh, yeah. No, no. I definitely try if that's what you – no matter where he is, I mean, I try. I mean, look, I love the guy. He's really, like, again, I always say he turned out to be just a great guy. I think it took me a bunch of years to even understand him. But um, right now, I think it's just his head's in the right spot. No, it's, it's nice that these guys say that. They, look, I'm not the guy I was 10 years ago or even six years ago. So, I mean, if that's ever coming back, I don't know. But So I try to adopt a different position – you know, is more of a like an overseer, maybe something like that. Right. But I can't get in there and do the things I used to. Um, and I've had other coaches tell me, "I think you're crazy. You shouldn't even hold be holding pants for anybody." Even Kenny, you mentioned that the other day. Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, definitely telling me you're, you're out of your mind. So, but I mean, it's what I love to do. And if I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna get carried out in in that, in that scenario. But yeah, so I just try to be there for everybody. Uh, 
I, it's look, these are good guys, man. We all grew up on Long Island as a common bond. And, uh, you know, me and Alger are always, you know, goofing around each other. When I go to Vegas, you know, he wants to show me a big movie theater. Look at this movie theater. You'd love it out here. And, huh. You know, the other day his friends came in with their kids. I was, they were like two. And I was saying they were just telling me how they wish their uncle Aljo was back on Long Island. You know, oh. so it's a funny, you know, bit going back and forth. But Vegas is definitely going to be his home. And bloody, uh, bloody, blah. I don't even know if I'm answering the question. but No, you are. Yeah. I just feel like a lot of coaches and fighters and commentators, there's a lot of sensitivity with all of these public figures. But I do think with a lot of athletes and coaches, hey, if you're going to go to Las Vegas, you know, and you're going to work with Eric Nixick, you know, a lot of people might have not wanted to continue the alignment. And I do think in large part, you just said something very telling that it took you a few years to really get to who Aljo was at his core. And largely, you've navigated this relationship with a champion on his terms with a little back and forth and a without lot of a, give. And without, yeah. Just giving you credit, not because you're my friend, no, that's all. No, no, without a doubt. No, really. He's, uh, yeah, you know, I've had some heart-to-hearts with him where I, I, I think I really know him and I think he knows exactly who I am. So, uh, yeah, you know, maybe 15 years ago, that, that scenario wouldn't have worked out with a younger me. You know, as I get older, I try to be more of like a patriarch to the team and just, you know, try to inject some common sense here and there, even though I might not have any myself. But when I'm outside looking in, yes. it's, uh, it's always easier, right? So, uh, right. I just, look, it's all, it's all about the W. It's all about seeing these guys succeed, you know, accomplish their dreams. And that's what makes me happy. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm odd or I'm weird, but uh, I, I think I'm blessed with a great life through the martial arts and I want to see all my fighters have the same, you know, happiness and success that I did. And I really think, like, without the martial arts, I wouldn't have been nowhere near. Well, you know what? I, I, I say this. I probably would have had more money but been less happy. You know, I have less money. And, and, yeah. I, and I'm happy. I could retire yeah. tomorrow. But I'm yeah. just happy. I'm just content where I am. I'm happy. So I'm trying to give back. But it, it's it's just hard to leave, like, even leave the gym at this point. I just, I yeah. do love being there. And I think it, you know, kind of keeps me young and, you know, It's got a dual purpose, but uh, I don't want to stick around too long where I'm hurting anybody either. You're not hurting anybody. You're just continuing to excel across multiple decades. Kemflo, get with the uh, Anakin Florian LLC CFO. Let's get an extra thousand bucks to Longo this quarter uh, because he would have been richer if he had chosen a different path. I knew knew that speed would pay off in one way or another. (laughs) He's making irrational decisions. Yeah, up that a thousand, yeah. By the way, if anyone does have Adderall, I'll be staying at uh, a hotel. (laughs) You can certainly drop it off. All right. I have a few other things that I would like to get to with you, uh, and then I'll get you out here at the bottom of the hour. Very excited to give you a big hug in Newark, New Jersey, by the way. Yes. All right. So for UFC Fight Pass, Kenny Florian and I host a segment called Anakin Florian Rewind, in which we go back and look at fights involving talent leading up to a big fight. So last week we looked at Aljamain Sterling's win over Corey Sandhagen, and we looked at Henry Cejudo's win over Dominic Cruz. How recently did you watch the fight between Henry Cejudo and Dominic Cruz, and was there any major extraction from that Henry performance? Kenny and I seem to remark a lot about the leg kicks from Cejudo, one of myriad weapons that he seemed to have uh, at his disposal against Cruzy three years ago. No, no, watch the fight a bunch of times, of course. I Because, I mean, if anybody's got, like, similar moving, it, they're definitely different. But both crew, I mean, both Dominic and Aljo will move. They're not really standing still too much. Uh, so I did watch that fight a lot. There's, a, you know, a couple of takeaways, but we'll uh, we'll wait to see what happens in the, uh, <laughs> in the octagon. Ah. But, you know, I mean, if the, if, if, as a coach, the first thing I'd like to test is Henry's gas tank for being away for three years, you know. I don't want him fighting on his terms. I'd like to see Aljo fight on his terms, and Aljo's got the gas tank to uh, to do it, and uh, that's where uh, I hope the fight goes. But I'm, I'm really excited. It's going to be a good fight. I'm telling you, Aljo's head's in the right spot. Uh, I really think this is a great fight, and I really all the respect to Henry. I really – I think what he's accomplished is unbelievable. And, you know, I, I don't even want to talk about the three-year layoff because yeah, you got to assume the guy did the right thing and he's ready to go. But I think he looked at Al Joey, like, again, I said at the beginning, I think he sees something that made him really want to jump at this fight that he thinks he can exploit. And we'll see if he can do it. 
Ray, what, what do you think this does for Aljo? You know, to beat someone like Cejudo, who is a two division champion, Olympic gold medalist, where do you think this puts Aljo as far as his legacy in the 135 pound division if he gets the win? I mean, Kenny, I think he's got, he's, this, this is huge for his legacy. You know what I mean? Look, I went, I did a, an interview the other day. They're always going to find something to hate on. Like, I just, it's just the way it is. But uh, to me, I think this cements his legacy. You know what I mean? I really do. I think with all the stuff he's been through, the win streak he's been on, uh, the way he's handled adversity, this win over Henry is, I think, is is huge for him. Huge. Because Henry is a two-time two-division champ, and he's done some really great stuff, too. Love what Henry's done. And I love the way Henry walked away from the game. I thought he did the right thing. He just, you know, got up and left and wanted to try new things and I hope he tried a lot of new things instead of training. Ha! But, uh, <laughs> we'll see. We got about four days. We'll, we'll see exactly what's going on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the greatest band and weight of all time conversation, but you go wins over Sandhagen, Jan, Jan, Dillashaw, Cejudo I mean, in this era. There hasn't even been a long reigning UFC band and weight champion. Much of Dominic Cruz's damage was in the WEC. This title has been there for the taking. And as great as Dillashaw's wins over Cody Garbrandt were, all of that is marred now. So you yeah, 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 Henry yeah, Zudo this weekend. To me, this is a very short conversation. Even if yes. Cruz is one of my best friends in the world, it's Aljamain Sterling every day of the week. Yeah, no, I think it's a no-brainer. I all think right. it is a no-brainer. But, you know, let's take one fight. Let's just get through this fight. Uh, again, I like where Aljo's head's at. I like what I'm seeing. And, um, I really, I'm really super excited for this. Really, really, this is going to be a good fight. Almost as excited as I am. And... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. Hey, listen. To your credit, I mean, you were on Aljo's bandwagon from day one. I will say that that that's true, right? I uh, know. I mean, I I was dating to the Johnny Eduardo fight. I felt like he could be a world champion, and I mean, uh, you, he's rounded you, himself out. Yeah, you called it. You know. Well, thanks, buddy. So in 406 episodes of this podcast, you telling us that maybe you want to try to extend Henry a little bit is probably the most telling thing you've ever told <laughs> us about one of your athletes leading up to a championship fight. So we thank you for that. A couple other moments <laughs> and questions here for Ray Longo on the way out. I think we do want to get a prediction from you on Gilbert Burns and Bilal Muhammad. So maybe you can marinate on that a little bit. But did you see this interaction between Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo in New Jersey? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I know you guys like each other, but can we? I mean, Corey <laughs> Sandhagen posted a great video. Like, what exactly is going on here? I'm not sure if it was pleasantries. It seemed like a very bizarre interaction. It seems like these guys just want to be around each other. They can't help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and that's to, I'm going to sum it up. That's Aljo being Aljo. I think he, whatever he said, he meant. He didn't think the guy was serious. He didn't know if the guy was going to show up. Right. Uh, yeah, Aljo's funny, man. There, I think there was absolutely no malice. He just wanted to say hello to the guy. And you know, that's it. Like, I, I, don't look, need... I, I, look, I look at that stuff and I can't stop laughing. I'll be honest with you. Because I don't think if, if Henry could figure this guy out, I'd give him a lot of credit. Uh, yeah, Kenny, I don't need like super heat and friction on every fight, but this seemed yeah. to be a pretty uh, weird interaction for me. Yeah, I, I, this is one of those things where I think, I think in an interesting way, Al Joe kind of went up to him and, and just said, hey, you know, I'm confident heading into this fight. I, I think he wanted to get a closer look to see what Henry was like and how he was feeling. And um, I, I thought I thought it was an interesting interaction as well, but I thought it was a little bit of mind games. And then kind of Henry kind of was trying to play mind games back a little bit. And I don't know. These are interesting exchanges. It's hard to gather what was going on, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think though that's what makes this sport so damn interesting, man. It was, yeah. I, that was, I think, look, it was hysterical. First, I'm telling you, there's not a bad bone in Aljo's body. He's, you right. know, even when he gets into like, you know, arguing with Henry like before, it's not the normal, you don't feel that venom, that hatred. You know, he's yeah. just responding. Like he's not yeah. it's 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 a weird that's why I say you've been getting to know him. I them you'd have to ask him. Yeah, I'm ask yeah. him in the fighter meeting what, yeah. what he's telling you. And he'll you know, he'll tell you exactly what he's thinking. But I think 
he just wanted to say hello to him and just you know, thank him for coming. I mean, and, <laughs> as weird as that and is. Ray, does Aljo, you know, Aljo was thanking Henry for the opportunity. Was he, was he alluding to the fact that like, this is a big fight where they could both make some money where Aljo, this is, you know, a potential good money maker for Aljo. Is that what he was kind of saying as well? I, I would, because I would, he, he sees it as a great opportunity, both because again, he gets to fight someone like a Henry Cejudo to cement yeah. his legacy yes. and to maybe make some good money. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say that's probably dead on. You know what I mean? He'll typically the first guy to tell you this prize fight, you know, the old saying, and he's, you know, he's he's doing great. And he wants to continue to do great. But, yeah, that's the, I'm going to say that's closer to what was going on than anything. Like, it was, I'm telling you, it was like, it was for real. It really wasn't, I don't believe it was a mind game. I think he, you know, he yeah. just, it is what it is, man. That's what you get with him. He's, he's right. funny. I no, that is what you get with him. And we all love Aljamain Sterling. And even when he was sort of pulling the masses as to a next opponent, he was surprised at how many people, and we've said this before, thought he should fight a returning Henry Cejudo instead of Sean O'Malley. It was essentially 50-50. Um, but don't sit here and tell me that the Cejudo payday is bigger than the O'Malley, O'Malley payday, Raymond. I mean, come on. No, I don't think so. But yeah. I, I, no, the O'Malley payday is uh, that's the that's the uh, biggest money maker in the division right now. Right. All right, I a would, few more. I would think Go that's ahead. why they're doing this fight first is to build up for that. Yep. I would think yep. they, the the more yeah the more uh, Sean has sitting out, I think it makes for a bigger fight in either in either direction. You know, for them, I, they're always. I I think that's the way they're looking at it for sure. And Matt Sarah's retirement as a corner, very much short-lived. He's going to be right there alongside you this weekend, correct? Yes, he will. I'm very happy okay. about that. Okay. Uh, before we get you out of here with a Gilbert Burns Bilal Muhammad prediction, yeah. it seemed like the promotion that won the weekend was Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships. And I was curious if you had any thoughts on, on that, the damage sustained, and everything else that came with that live event. Uh, definitely too. Then I think that for me to take away is, you know, that the UFC does a great job in building up, you know, brand, your know, branding individuals. I think that's why you saw a lot of people order that you had Eddie Alvarez, Mendez, Camozzi, uh, who's the big guy that fought, uh, the King of Kenosha, ben, big Ben Rothwell, Ben Rothwell, you know, uh, rock hold. I mean, it was really a UFC card, Ben knuckle, but you know, with a lot of guys, you know, in their 40s, you know what I mean, or close or getting up there. So I think it was a uh, my, my thoughts were it's incredible how these guys could jump around like that, where I think other organizations, you can't do that. So they do a great job in building up everybody as far as the damage. Uh, well, man, yeah, it's I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, what, what, Have Luke you Rock ever was? cornered an athlete in a bare knuckle setting? Uh, I'm going to say no. Because, Kenny, I'm looking at Jason Perillo in the Rockhold corner, and he just sort of looked like he had one foot in, almost like, what am I doing here? But maybe he has before. I just think for a corner, man, it's got to be a a new situation. I mean, I I didn't corner, but I did help Paulie Malinaji out when he fought uh, the Russian guy, um, Artem Loboff. But I wasn't in the corner. But, uh I, don't know. I I thought it was I felt bad for Rockhold man going out like that you yeah. know right well you handsome guys stick up for each other right oh yeah plus you know yeah. if you had old shitty teeth like me John they wouldn't have came out you know those fucking fake veneers you motherfuckers are walking I'm looking at these I'm looking these at are this how the these are mine these are so white what about See the top ones? The top these are all mine hey tell them how they your teeth big- are so white. I got Florian chiclets. These things. These things are thick, big. I, when I was when I was little, though, they looked massive. Now that I have a big head, they huh. look like you know normal. But these are I, mine. I, then I, yeah, I mean, I never I mean, got I hit like I never got hit in the face ever in a fight. Ever. Oh huh. shit! I don't believe not, this. You got, look how white your teeth are. <laughs> look at those Peruvian tusks in his mouth. Holy this is what crap. they look like back in the day. <laughs> oh, uh, Can you stop doing that? You scared the shit out of I me. I did have braces though. I did have braces. So I was just making fun of coffee t- teeth last week. Who brought that to your attention? Oh, about 10 people. Huh. I'm just having a little bit of fun. I'm not trying to be ruthless. Uh, I don't know what the, I, what I got to get my teeth white now. No, you don't have to get your teeth white. And I just said, enjoy your cold brew and maybe brush your teeth on the back end. Just having a little fun here. 
Well, you know? Gee, I tell you, Kenny, holy shit. I'm afraid. I'm, I can't even smile anymore on here. <laughs> well, oh, that's a nice earshot. Oh, my God. Oh, my what's God. really. Uh, ay, ay, ay. What's really sad about all of this is that uh, <laughs> somehow this is going to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Before we let you go, Gilbert Burns, a slight betting favorite right now on DraftKings Sportsbook against Bilal. Remember the name Muhammad. $200 is being sent your way if you can correctly predict that fight. So give uh, us a prediction. Correctly, we'll who's, uh, I think it's, man, I think the odds are spot on. It's a close fight. I'm going to have to go with uh, Gilbert Burns again because uh, he's fought the better competition up until this point. But All right. Bilal is a dog. I don't I don't know. He's going to make that fight. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just going to pick Burns based on experience. All right. Thank you for your contributions to the program. I'm going to text Bilal that you uh, are picking Gilbert, and uh, we will talk to you on, uh, <laughs> on Sunday afternoon. We're actually going to do a quick turn and uh, tape the episode on Sunday, the day after really? the pay-per-view. So uh, hope that Sunday doesn't or- interfere with your weekend, but hopefully it's a celebration Sunday on the Anakin Florian Podcast. Sunday at what time? What time are we looking at? Whatever time you – well, I mean, uh, very late in the day, if that's what you're Oh, asking. late in the day. All right, good. Oh, that's yeah. Perfect. I'm talking like 5.30 p.m. Oh, that's Eastern. perfect, yeah. All right. Okay. Kenny's right. smirking over there. Kenny, send me, can, <laughs> you send me your, can you send me your teeth whiteners or your periodontist? <laughs> can you send his name? Look at him. I will. Let's smile, I will. John. Let me see well, your teeth, John. Just because I got a little tan, that's why they look a little whiter. Unbelievable, man. I got to go My get whiteners. My teeth are real. I they mean, I real. brush them three times a day. How many, I mean, how many times a day do you brush? Twice? Like once a week. All right. <laughs> Is that good or bad? I think it's fine. Perfect. I think it's fine. Hey, we love you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in a couple days, buddy. All the best with Al Joe. Oh, right, Matt Favola, go, through Dober. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Let's just say, but Favola looks great. Shout out to Favola, man. Let's give this kid some love. He'll be very, uh, he's very uh, sensitive. So uh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be an interesting fight. They both have really tough yeah. fights against great opponents. And that's what you want. So I think it's going to be a great the, night for everybody. You see the betting line on that one? I'm sure Favola is a huge underdog. Not that big. Plus 180. Drew Dober minus 210. Uh, all right. I would have thought it would have been more like 240 plus. Two. That's good. That's not bad. All right, I'll man. take Hey, it. huge weekend, buddy. I'll see you in a few days. All right. Take it easy, guys. Good luck, Ray. Take care. Thank you. Every week here on the Anakin Florian podcast and – I don't know if he's messing with me or what, wanting me to like tone it down during a pay-per-view week, but uh, <laughs> we'll take that conversation off the air because now joining us for what has become a monthly spot, you know, I was playing with names for this segment, like put the shine on Sheehan. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do here. Sheehan shine. I like the verb shine. I like this guy even better. Host of the Severe MMA podcast, Severe MMA, Sean Sheehan. You can find the Sheehan show on SureDog.com. Appreciate your time as always, brother. Good Tuesday. How are you? I'm not too bad now with a busy weekend with cage warriors here in Ireland so I was uh, at that for the weekend so very busy weekend uh, every weekend seems to be a busy weekend in the world of MMA but uh, yeah I'm good now it's great to see you know the, the next level of Irish MMA I suppose coming on to uh, the, the world scene so there was some great talent on that card and some great talent coming up next week as well. And I know your love life is in a good position, but if your significant other likes weekends and hanging out on them, she might need to find a different man. Uh, you did mention you just <laughs> finished covering Cage Warriors 153 in Dublin. And it seemed like on Twitter you were sort of blown away by the in-house production or something that this live event held for you. And what I always tell people, if you haven't been to a UFC live event, you just got to understand how much effort is put into the in-house. So what was it about that live event that that had you on the Twitter machine uh, shouting them out? It it was great because they – so a a lot of the the promotions – around here they, they throw on the fights we have the fights they're great fights and that's it but i uh, ksw came a few years ago and i was blown away if anyone's watched the ksw show it's unbelievable and cage warriors were in cork in a smaller arena down in the country just before the pandemic so it's good what four years ago at this stage but they were in the big arena you know with five or six thousand people there and they put on like this light show before the show started with like you know the, the song this is the greatest show it was 
unbelievable. They lit up the cage. They did another one like, uh, you know, Teenage Wasteland that the UFC do. They had their own version of that before the main card. It was just wow. really good. And the great thing about Cage Warriors as well, like if let's say you're a UFC fan, they have the octagon. So it's the same cage as, as the UFC, which a lot of other promotions don't do. They're on UFC Fight Pass. It's it's like the it's the road to the UFC kind of for this side of the world, and it's really great. Like I'm, I'm sure a lot of the lads you talk about, Arnold Allen came through Cage Warriors, Conor McGregor came through Cage Warriors, Kyle Pinder, Michael Bisping, Dan Hardy, so many others came through Cage Warriors, and they're still doing a great job of it at the moment. And it's funny, there's kind of a big divide around here at the moment. Do you go the Cage Warriors route, which is you know not the best paying route, I suppose, in the world to get to the UFC? Or do you go to the other places like Bellator, like PFL, and you know, Brave and Octagon and places which are playing good money, but you're probably not going to be getting to the UFC if you go that route anytime soon anyway. And it's it's a big debate here, but what it's creating is is this buzz in Irish MMA. There's, obviously, we had Cage Warriors um, on Saturday. There's another Cage Warriors card later in the year. There's a Bellator card later in the year. There's a PFL card later in the year, all in Ireland as well. So this is absolutely massive. And we hope, obviously, that the UFC will be back at some stage as well. So... It's, there's a real buzz around Irish MMA at the moment. It's absolutely fantastic. No, it's very exciting, and you set it up beautifully. So in terms of you coming to the U.S. or going to see Ken Flo at a PFL event, I'd imagine you have to be pretty selective. I mean, there are major national media outlets in the United States who don't send a reporter to our big pay-per-views. So I know it's a little bit problematic no matter where you are, but like if Conor McGregor fights September, October, like do you come to Vegas or not necessarily? No, I, I would. I haven't gone to any of the American cards yet. Uh, some of the lads that work with Severe May have gone before. My colleague Graham, who works uh, on the, who's the co-host of the Severe May podcast with me, he actually produced the Conor McGregor notorious documentary uh, that's been on, you know, Netflix and and everywhere like that. So he kind of traveled with him and a few of my other colleagues, Andrew McGahan, who used to work for us back in yep. the day, he went over to those uh, as well. But no, I haven't gone to them. I'm, I'm so busy now. I. It's almost impossible, you know, when you're creating three shows a week for uh, uh, for sure, dog. I've with our Patreon as well and Severe May and in the Severe May right. podcast as well. It's just, it's impossible. Like, I, for, even to go to the shows, say the, the Bellator shows, I go on the Wednesday and come back on the Sunday. You have to just prepare so much and do so much for the week ahead that it's like some people might think it's a holiday or a few days away it's it just like ruins your month in there <laughs> you have to do so much work so a trip to the US I imagine would be even worse I hope at some stage I'd love to do it at some stage maybe a big McGregor fight or something like that but it's it's tough it's just so tough Sean um obviously UFC 288 is coming up uh some great fights on that card uh I I think one of the more intriguing ones for me is the Bilal Muhammad Gilbert Burns fight. Um, how do you see that one, and and who do you think is going to come out on top? It's a tough fight. I, I think the five rounds is a big, big thing here for Bilal. I think it really, really benefits benefits him because you look at Gilbert Burns and you see his last few fights, and I think what he has done, especially in the the Masvidal fight, he fought at a, a way slower sort of pace. Now, not not so much against Shemaev because it's Shemaev, but it, it won him the fight against Masvidal, but maybe he didn't look as brilliant as he has in the past. I actually think that sort of style will benefit him fighting against Bilal, but also you you give up, the, and we, you know, we always talk about judging, you give up what makes you special in terms of taking rounds off people. So if you're Gilbert Burns and you go out and you fight at a faster pace, you land big shots, you're way more likely to win a round. You go out there and you you get him to the ground, you get get someone in a submission, you know, you could finish the fight or, you know, you're going to win the round if you get him in a real bad position. When he's fighting a slower pace, maybe it's probably a more intelligent pace, you know, if you don't want to get punched in the face over and over, it's a smart way of doing it, but it also makes the fight closer. And, you know, Bilal gets a takedown late in the round, lands five or six elbows, the fight goes the other way. So I'm I'm very interested. I think there's a lot of fights in this, uh, on this card. A lot of lads with similar enough styles, and it's very hard to predict how it's going to go. With yeah. this one, I think what may, and this that's not necessarily for this fight, but for this one, I think it's hard to, to predict how it's going to go because you have Bilal, who you would think against most guys is going to try to wrestle him. His wrestling has been so good over the last while. But who wants to go to the ground with Gilbert Burns with how good he is down there? And in your Bilal, you maybe want to pick him off on the feet. Well, Gilbert in his last few fights has been trying to kind of pick lads off on the feet more. And then you're playing into his game that he wants to fight now as well. So I don't know. I find it very, very, very hard to predict. 
look, my go-to, and this has been wrong multiple times, but my go-to is almost always that wrestling beats jujitsu. So, you know, maybe I'm I'm good doing the uh, the Anik Florian pick here, but I think I'm going for Bilal in this one. I think I am. I really like the way you look at that fight. It seems as though Khabib Nurmagomedov suggested to Bilal Muhammad that he try to get this to be a five-round fight. Now, perhaps that is because stylistically he believes it would be advantageous. I really do believe that Bilal's interest and Gilbert's in five rounds is to make it clear, crystal, to everybody that this is a welterweight title eliminator. And if it does end up going 25 minutes... I do think for the winner, that's a huge feather in the cap in terms of laying a foundation for a championship opportunity. It still does seem that Colby Covington is going to be next, but uh, whoever wins that fight is going to be next in line. Uh, I want to talk to you about the main event between Henry Cejudo and Aljamain Sterling. I also, time permitting, want to talk to you about your long conversation with Patty Pimblett. But when you're handicapping a layoff like this, even if it's an all-time great, to what extent do you factor that in? Because I think some people are very dismissive of it, and some people lead their handicap with that very thing. Uh, I would be the one who'd be leading with it. So I think that's yeah. the main thing here. I, I think there's two questions with Henry Cejudo, right? Why did he leave? Why is he coming back? Uh, the question, why did he leave? My thought on that for a long time was he left because, you know, maybe he wanted to get a bigger money offer. He wanted, okay, you kind of miss me there for six months or a year. I'm coming back didn't really work out great for him and now it's three years down the line and here he is now well it worked out in the end he got a title shot put for a title he already had so yeah i don't know right. um but then i watched the, the countdown show and he said you know he had a child you know got married and all of that in the meantime so he was saying that was it and then i was looking for the second part of that question why is he coming back and i never really got the answer to that watching that countdown show like why is he coming back is he coming back just because he kind of waited so long that he had to come back almost at this stage. He was never actually retired. I never for a second believe he was tired. Now I don't believe right. retired. I don't believe anyone's retirement. <laughs> to be honest, I still think Kenny's gonna make a comeback. Huh. <laughs> but I, I I don't know. Like, is it just for one last payday? Or is he, you know, is he back and wanting to fight in six months and twelve months and eighteen months again? It's very, very tough to know. The other part of that is the game changes a lot in three years. It really, really does. Like, has he has he been able to keep up with it? Like, will he be able to keep up with it? Aljamain Sterling's in there, and he said it himself in that countdown show, he's fighting the best guys in the world right now. And okay, it's, a few of them fights have turned out to be a bit weird, but that Yan fight in the middle, that was a real fight, a very, very close fight against one of the best guys in the world, and he's been in there, whereas Cejudo hasn't. I think it's a massive negative. Now, that doesn't mean I think Cejudo can't win, or I mean, I'm not, I would suggest someone wouldn't pick him or anything like that, but it I don't think you can call it a positive if you're looking at it before the fight. I think Henry Cejudo's mind might be his most powerful asset. We'll see if he can get his body after three years away to do what he wants it to do. And I think you're right. My biggest question in the fighter meeting, and it'll probably go unanswered in that setting too, is why exactly are you back? Because I do believe that there was some promotional reluctance to give him, him an immediate title shot, but they settled on that. Like, do you think, Sean, that if he beats out Jermaine Sterling spectacularly that he's going to fight the winner of Alexander Volkanovsky and Yair Rodriguez? I mean, do you think that that C4 is actually a realistic thing? Because that actually makes sense in terms of a comeback. I, I think that's what, what he'll call for if he wins the fight. See, the yeah. weird thing about, about Henry, it's you don't really know the truth with him because like he's playing this character all the time and things and it's for someone like me and like I, I've always said it with Colby as well it's very frustrating you actually kind of you want to hear the real part of these you know people's minds and stuff and that's I love going to you know going to events and talking to fighters and stuff you get that from them and it's brilliant when you see that but for someone like Henry I feel like maybe we have a few years ago but not in a while so who knows but yeah, I, it's either going to be one of two things. He'll either win and he's saying he's retiring again and try to play that game. Now, it was a bad game he played the last time, so he probably wise not to do that. But I right. think he's dead right. Considering as well, there isn't a genuine number one contender after the unification about like Aaron Allen should have been it. I think most people right. would have agreed with that. And then the Holloway fight happened. You know, there, there's a few guys coming up. I think Ilya Tapuria is the next guy. I think he's going to be great, but it, he's fighting coming up soon, I think, isn't he? So he's not quite there yet, and he's still down the rankings a little bit. So it'd be a perfect time if he did win this and called him out, <laughs> called out uh, either Volkanovski or Yair. But I think, you know, Dan has, has been a bit reluctant to play the Sahudo game. Right. So we'll have right. to wait on that one, I suppose. 
Severe MMA's Sean Sheehan with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. You can find him on social media at Sean Sheehan BA. So do you bet on fights? I I do with the odd time. No, I've lost so much money betting on fights. <laughs> I don't bet on fights as much as I do, but I do my betting show every week over at Sherlock and all. So I, I do keep an eye, uh, I keep an eye on the fights. I, I wouldn't be the biggest better in the world, but I've every big bet I've ever done, I've always lost it. So I'm no I'm no worse, I'm no worse better. My record this year is uh I've picked 51 fights and won 26 of them, I believe. So just right, there you go. All right. Not too bad. So someone, and I say this all the time, that I would lose money if I was contractually allowed to bet on mixed martial arts. But even somebody like you that fine tooth combs all of this stuff, uh, you're hitting about 500. And the, the professional sports bettors who realize financial freedom betting on sports, they're only hitting about 56%. So we haven't talked to you in a little while. I had the chance to sit down uh, and have a long conversation with your friend Ben Cartledge on a bus ride in some foreign nation, which was pretty cool. Am I allowed to ask you, like overall over the last few months, how you feel like the state of scoring has been? Like, is that a fair question? Yeah, that's a fair question. I think um, I wouldn't say bad. I wouldn't say great. It hasn't been as good, I think, as it was. We hit a sweet spot two years ago ish, yep. uh, and it went downhill. You know, we've spoken about the adjustment to the ten eights and everything like that. A big issue recently. Uh, and I was talking to, to someone about it over the weekend. There's been a lot of like clashing cards and clashing weekends. Let's say, you know, what was it, two weeks ago? Bellator had Friday night, Saturday night, and the UFC had uh, had the Saturday night card. That's a lot of judges you need. You know, it's a lot of judges. And it's yeah. funny, you mentioned Ben Cartledge there. And he was doing, uh, I was talking to him at the weekend, but he does the Cage Warriors cards, right? And usually when there's a Cage Warriors card, there's either three or four judges. And they do the whole card. And it's extremely consistent. It's always extremely consistent. And then you go and you look, say, a UFC card, and maybe there's seven or nine judges or something like that. Obviously, three on every fight, and they, they rotate. And sometimes it can be a little less consistent. And the biggest problem is we go to places like uh, Texas, which is the worst, Kansas City, and other places. And there's judges that have, uh, you know, they could be great judges. I'm not criticizing the, the people at all, but the, who I am criticizing is the commissions that put them into those places. The Cheetah Vera fight was the perfect fight. A guy, if you go over to MMADecisions.com, he had like four decisions ever out of Bellator, PFL, UFC, or any of those big cards. I'm sure he's done a few on the local scene. But that's not good enough to be in a UFC main event. That is not good enough. And I, I saw people saying, anyone in the world, I was sitting at home and I could have judged it. It's very, very different. Sitting there with fifteen or 16,000 people behind you, roaring and shouting yeah. after absolutely every punch. It's very different. And to put someone with uh, that level of experience into a spot like that, you're asking for someone to hand in a horrendous card. That's a massive problem. We like we have a lot of big issues in in judging. To be honest, one of the biggest issues I think I've mentioned it before is the judges' placement at the cage. Sometimes they place them behind one of those screens yeah. and they can't see it. I saw Ron sure. McCarthy once; it was a big head kick, knockout, and like he barely moved his uh, his head and he was able to see it. That's another big issue. The ten eight is a big a big issue, but yeah, I am um, I I I think there are, are those issues. I I still think you know I I, I like the criteria. I like the better before it, they changed the 10 eight. But one massive thing that I think has helped is you mentioned Ben Cartledge and his colleague, David Letheby as well from the UK. Yep. They have both been brought in to the U S to help out. Cause there's a look at uh, the UFC doing uh, a lot of apex cards. There's a lot of work for those judges uh, in, uh, in Vegas. So they've been brought in to help. And I think that has really, really helped as well and will help, you know, they've only done a few cards so far, but it will help going forward. And I think that's a, a thing that the UFC, Bellator, and all the promotions should do even more is bring the best judges into the big cards. All right, we've got a couple more minutes here with Sean Sheehan. One of the biggest knockouts this year was the Israeli Yanal Ashmuz spoiling the UFC debut of one Sam Patterson. Now, relative to your expectations for a guy like Sam Patterson, how surprising is that result? And I guess I'm just curious, big picture, like I know there have been certain guys like CLD that you really plant your flag on when they come into the UFC from that part of the world. Uh, how surprised were you to see Sam Patterson go down like that relative to your overall expectations for him in the UFC? 
Um, I'm not sure. Really. Like, I'll be honest here. He wasn't one of the, the guys I had written in a notebook to say uh, he's going to be. This. I think a part of that was he wasn't fighting kind of in the local scene. I think he was over in maybe Brave or yes. somewhere like that. Yep. And uh, I, I've watched him and I know he's a good fighter, but he, like you mentioned, Christian here, I don't care. He is a guy I think who could be a ranked UFC fighter right now. And he's only like nine fights into his career or something like that. There are guys, there's one guy on the scene at the moment. Paul Hughes is his name. He's a 145er. He's the champion in Cage Warriors. And this guy it needs to be in the UFC. If Dana White is listening to this, sign him. This guy, I, I'm telling you, maybe in the UFC, not now, right? If he was in Bellator right now, I think he'd be the champion. I think he'd beat Patricio Pitbull. That's how good I think this guy is. Go and watch his last fight on UFC Fight Pass against Jordan Vucinic. It went to a decision, but it was one of the biggest destructions of a fight I have ever seen. He is as legit as they come. You want to talk about Ian Gary? This is the next Ian Gary. And apparently, apparently the UFC are, are not signing him. I, I spoke to Graham Bynum last week. They're not signing him because he's gone to a decision a few times in a row. Now, there's three really good guys in that division at the moment. Vucinic, who I just mentioned, he should be in the UFC too. And Martin Charrier, who is a massive, massive uh, celebrity over in France. Uh, he's on he's his own like YouTube channel and all this, and he's a very good fighter too. But this guy, Paul Hughes, he should be in the UFC. That, if, that, if anyone out there wants a name, that's the name. All right. No, I'm looking for that. What about my guy, Will Curry? It looks like he lost to Mick Stanton at Cage Warriors 151 back in March. So it might be a little bit of a slower climb for Will Curry. He did. That. That's a very interesting judging fight to watch. Uh, it was one of those ones where Will Curry got a lot of uh, ground control time. But Stanton, he did a great job. He kind of got into like this kind of kimura twistery type of position and turned him around and ended up on top and landed some good shots and won it. He's a guy that's been around for a good long time. And that's when you go through the cage warriors route. You, if you're a young yeah. guy coming up in the sport and you're meeting, uh, you're meeting people who have been around and done it and fought some of the best guys. It's not easy to get through them. It's not easy yeah. to get through yeah. them. Will Curry, you, you only have to look at a picture of him to see what's great about him. His physique is absolutely yeah. unbelievable. But look, I, I thought he'd win that fight, but I also thought if he did win that fight, he needs two, three, four more before he's going to the UFC. He's one of yeah. those guys. I'm not saying he can't be that in the future, but right now I don't yeah. think so. He was in Modestus Bukowskis' corner and just was absolutely brilliant, and that's why we gave him some shine on the broadcast, and that's why I'm monitoring his career closely, but I think you're spot on three or four more, and uh, maybe we'll see Will Curry in the big show. All right, before we let you go, you had a long chat recently with Patty Pimblett. Just curious if there were any major takeaways on that, and uh, what do you think the future holds for him maybe later this year into 2024? I Look, the most interesting thing that, that came from that was um, – he said he had surgery seven weeks before it, and he just did his first rehab session that day, I think, or the day before, which to me suggests that is a very, very bad injury. You know, yeah. to, to wait to have to wait for seven weeks. And I saw, I saw a picture of him the other day. He was in a boot and everything. You know, I think he told someone else as well it's going to be towards the end of the year. So this has been a very bad injury, a, a worse injury than I think anyone would have uh, would have predicted. So. Yeah, it was it was interesting. I, I had Batty on, you know, Cage Warriors kind of got him on to predict the card, and I asked him a couple of questions about Cage Warriors, and he didn't really seem that that uh, up for answering them. And then I asked him uh -huh. about like injury and the last time and Jared Garden and all that, and he was mad to answer those sort of questions. So <laughs> uh, look, that, that's Batty. When we get him back, yeah. I think um, uh, I, I think he'll be right at it again. I, it, you know, it's interesting to see how the fans will react to him. Like that last fight was not good for him to the lead up with all the drama that went on. And then after the fight, you know, it, when a lot of people thought he had lost. Right. I think the next fight is a big bounce back fight. Oh. For, whether it's a rematch or anything, it's it's massive. Because the interesting thing, look, I've been watching Paddy for years and years and years. A lot of people might think if they're watching in, in the US, Paddy's a, uh, come, he's on the way up. You know, he's a prospect. He's not, you know, Paddy's in the prime of his career right now. Yeah. He was fighting Saren back four and five years ago and really, really good fighters. He won a title in cage where he's lost. It came back again, had five or six fights after that. This is the prime of Paddy's career and he needs to do it now. And injuries are a big issue and all of this. It's, it's going to be an interesting next year for Paddy. Massive, I think. Beautifully put. It's going to be a huge, huge next fight for Patty Pimblett, whether it's against Jared Gordon or uh, or anybody else. All right, if you want more from Sean Sheehan, cranking out three shows a week at Sean Sheehan BA. We appreciate your time, brother, and uh, enjoy the pay per view. And by the way, if you ever want to come to the U.S. as a fan and go to one of these show in a non-working capacity, say the word. My tickets are yours, bro. 
I, I think that's a better idea than going to work. Right. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. Right, we'll that. Thank you, buddy. Good to talk to you as usual. Sean Sheehan with hey, us Sean. here on the Anakin Florian podcast. He speaks a little bit to the navigation of cranking out several shows a week. And just to peel back the curtain for you folks a little bit. So I will get off the air at about 2 or 3 in the morning after the post-fight show at UFC 288, right? Then I have a few hours. I'll do some voiceover work in New York City on Sunday, and then we are taping our next episode, or I guess episode 408 next week at 445. And all the while, during my pay-per-view week in Newark, New Jersey, I'll be voicing the show in Charlotte, North Carolina, right? So sometimes there is this condensed nature of the preparation, and uh, I feel Sean Sheehan's pain on that front. All right, we are done for today. Good news, though. Right back in your life at about 48 hours. Predictions for UFC 288 from Kenny Florian and Brian Petrie. We will have no fewer than seven predictions coming up in about 48 hours. Thank you to our guests today, Ray Longo and Sean Sheehan. Our producer is the great Cody Merrow. Also be sure to check out the aforementioned a and Rewind on UFC Fight Pass this week. A look back at recent wins. I shouldn't say recent, but wins for Henry Cejudo and Aljamain Sterling. All right, with that, for Kenny Florian, I'm John Anna. Thank you all for listening, for watching the Anakin Florian Podcast, UFC 288. Back in a few days. We'll talk to you before then, right here on the draft.